Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. Hippias Major by Plato. Translated by George Burgess. Persons of the Dialogue. Socrates and Hippias. Socrates. O oh, thou, the handsome and clever Hippias, after how long a time hast thou now again arrived at Athens? Hippias. I have had no leisure time, Socrates, for when Ellis wants to transact any business with any other state, she always comes to me the first, selecting me as an ambassador from the citizens, from her conceiving that I am the most competent to be a judge of the arguments urged by each of the states, and to report upon them. Hence I have often gone to other cities as an ambassador, but most frequently, and on points the most in number, and of greatest importance, to Lacedaemon. Hence it is why, as regards your question, I do not often come to these parts. Socrates. This it is, Hippias, to be a person truly wise and accomplished. For as a private individual you are able to obtain no little money from young men, and to impart more benefit than you receive. And as a public man are able to do your own state good service, as he should do, who would not be held in contempt, but be in good repute with the many. But, Hippias, what is the reason why those men of the olden time, whose names are so renowned for wisdom, Pittacus and Bias, and Thales of Miletus, and his disciples, and those who come after, down to Anaxagoras, appear all, or most of them, to have kept aloof from public affairs? Hippias, what else, Socrates, can you suppose than that they were unable or not sufficiently fit to reach by their intellect to both subjects, public and private. Socrates. Shall we then by Zeus affirm that as the other arts have improved, and the operatives of former times were of no mark as compared with those of the present, so the art of you, sophists, has improved likewise, and that those of the ancients who were engaged in the study of wisdom were persons of no mark in comparison with you? Hippias, you speak perfectly correctly. Socrates, if then Hippias were biased to come now to life again, he would be exposed to ridicule as compared with you, just as our modern statuaries assert that Daedalus, were he alive to execute such works as those from which he gained his great name, would become ridiculous. Hippias, it is as you say, Socrates. I am, however, accustomed myself to praise highly the men of the olden time, or even our immediate predecessors before, and, more than the moderns, acting with a feeling of caution as regards the envy of the living, and of fear as regards the anger of the dead. Socrates. Correctly, Hippias, as it seems to me, are you thinking upon and considering the matter? And I too can testify that you are speaking the truth and that your art has in reality improved in enabling you to transact public affairs conjointly with private. For Gorgias, the great sophist of Leontium, came hither on an embassy from his country, as being the man most competent among the Leontines to transact public affairs, and was thought to speak the best before the people here, and at the same time, by making a display of his powers in private, and associating with young men, he gained and carried away great sums of money from this city. Or, if you wish for another instance, our friend, Prodicus himself, has frequently come hither in a public capacity from elsewhere. But on arriving the last time, not long since, publicly from chaos, and speaking before the council, he was held in high repute, and, by making a display of his powers in private, and associating with young men, he gained a wonderful heap of money but of those ancient sages not one ever thought proper to demand money by way of a fee for making a display of their wisdom before persons of all climes. Such simpletons were they, and so completely did it escape them that money was a thing of great value, whereas each of the preceding made more money from his wisdom than has any operative in whatever trade you will, and even prior to these did Protagoras. Hippias you know nothing, Socrates, about these beautiful things, for if you knew how much money I have made, you would be amazed. The other instances I pass by. But having gone once to Sicily, while Protagoras was residing there in high repute, 
and rather advanced in years, I did, although much younger, gain in a very short time more than one hundred fifty mina. Nay, from Inukum, a very small town, I took above twenty. This, when I arrived home, I carried and gave to my father, so that it struck him and the rest of the citizens with wonder and astonishment, and I almost think I have made more money than any two sophists together, whom you choose to name. Socrates. You bring forward, Hippias, truly a good and great proof, both of your own wisdom and of the men of the present day, how superior they are as compared with those of the olden time. For of your predecessors, down to Anaxagoras, great is proclaimed the folly, according to your statement. For to Anaxagoras, they say, happened the very opposite to what has befallen you. For of the great wealth left him he took no care, and lost it all, in so silly a manner did he act the sophist. And of the other ancient sages, other stories of a similar kind are told. You seem then to produce this as a good proof of the wisdom of the moderns as compared with the ancients. And many indeed agree with you that the wise man should be wise for himself especially. And of such a person, this is the one definition, he who can make the most money, let this then suffice. And now, tell me, from which of the cities, whither you went, did you gain the greatest money? Is it not plain it was from Sparta, whither you went the oftenest? Hippias. Not by Zeus from thence, Socrates. Socrates. How say you? The least, then? Hippias. Never anything at all. Socrates. A monstrous and marvellous account you are giving, Hippias. But tell me, has not that wisdom of yours the power to make those who associate with you and learn it better as regards virtue? Hippias. Yes, very much so, Socrates. Socrates. Were you then able to make the sons of the Inutians better, but unable to make the sons of the Spartans? Hippias. Far from it. Socrates. Are the Siciliots desirous of becoming better, but the Spartans not? Hippias. The Lacedaemonians are, Socrates, very desirous. Socrates, was it then from their want of money that they shunned your society? Hippias, by no means, for they have enough of it. Socrates, what then could it be, that although they were desirous of virtue, and had money, and you were able to benefit them to the greatest extent, they did not send you away loaded with wealth? Was it that the Lacedaemonians can educate their sons better than you? shall we say this, and do you concede it is so? Hippias, by no manner of means, Socrates. Were you then unable to persuade the young men at Lacedaemon that by associating with you they would make a greater progress in virtue than by associating with their own people? Or were you unable to persuade their fathers that they ought to hand over their children to you rather than take that care upon themselves, if they had any regard for their children? for surely they did not grudge their sons becoming as virtuous as possible. Hippias, I do not think they felt any grudge. Socrates, in good truth, Lacedaemon is a well-regulated city. Hippias, how not? Socrates, now, in well-regulated cities, virtue is most highly prized. Hippias, certainly. Socrates, and to impart this to another, you know the best of all men. Hippias, by much so, Socrates. Socrates. Now, would not the man who could best impart the art of horsemanship be the most honoured and acquire the most wealth in Thessaly, or wherever else in Greece this art is cultivated the most? Hippias, it is likely. Socrates. Will he, then, who can impart instruction of the greatest value with respect to virtue, be honoured the most and make the most money if he wishes it, not at Lacedaemon and any other of the well-regulated states in Greece, but in Sicily, rather, as you think, my friend, or at Inukum? Shall we, Hippias, give credit to this? For if you command, I must do so. Hippias, it is not, Socrates, the custom of the country for the Lacedaemonians to disturb their laws, nor to educate their children contrary to established usages. Socrates, how say you? Think you, that it is the custom of the country for the Lacedaemonians not to act correctly, but to do wrong? Hippias. I would not say so, Socrates. 
Socrates. Would they not do right then to educate their sons in the better way, and not in the worse? Hippias. They would do right, but it is not lawful for them to give a foreign education, since, rest assured, that if any one else ever took away money from thence by teaching, I should have taken by much the most, for they delight greatly in listening to me, and give me praise. But what I am saying is not law. Socrates. Say you, Hippias, that the law is an injury or a benefit to a state. Hippias. It is enacted, I presume, for a benefit, but sometimes the law, when improperly enacted, does an injury. Socrates. What then? Do not they who enact a law lay it down as the greatest good to a state? For without law it is impossible to live in a state of good government. Hippias, you speak the truth. Socrates. When, therefore, they who undertake to frame laws fail in procuring a good, they have missed what is lawful and law? Or how say you? Hippias. Accurately speaking, Socrates, such is the case, but men are not used to give that name. Socrates. Do you mean, Hippias, those who know the truth, or who do not know it? Hippias. I mean the many. Socrates. Are the many, then, those who know the truth? Hippias. Certainly not. Socrates. But surely they who do know it do in reality conceive that what is to all men more beneficial is more agreeable to law than what is less beneficial. Or do not you grant this? Hippias. I grant that they do hold so in reality. Socrates. Do not things exist, and are in the state, as those who are knowing conceive? Hippias. Undoubtedly. Socrates. Now it is, as you assert, more beneficial for the Lacedaemonians to receive a foreign education under yourself, than after the system of their own country. Hippias. And I assert the truth. Socrates. Because what is more beneficial is more conformable to law? And this Hippias, do you say? Hippias, I have so said. Socrates, according then to your reasoning, it is more conformable to law for the sons of the Lacedaemonians to be instructed by Hippias, and less so by their fathers, if perchance they shall in reality be more benefited under you. Hippias, and benefited they would be, Socrates. Socrates, the Lacedaemonians then act contrary to law, in not giving you their gold, and committing their sons to your care. Hippias, in this I agree with you, for you seem to produce an argument in my favour, and there is no need for me to oppose it. Socrates, we find then, my friend, the Lacedaemonians to act contrary to law, and this too in matters of the greatest moment, they who are thought to be most observant of law. And yet, by the gods, did they praise you, and were delighted at hearing, what? Or is it not evident that the subjects were those which you know the best, relating to the stars and celestial events. Hippias, not at all. Such subjects they cannot endure. Socrates, but they delight in hearing something about geometry. Hippias, not at all, for many of them know not, so to say, even how to reckon. Socrates, they are then far from enduring you while making a display on the keeping of accounts. Hippias, very far indeed by Zeus. Socrates, but the subjects, then, were those in which you can the most accurately of all men draw distinctions, respecting the powers of letters and syllables, and rhythms and harmonies. Hippias, what harmonies or letters, my good man? Socrates, what, then, are the subjects which they gladly hear from you and commend? Tell me yourself, since I cannot find them. Hippias, respecting the genealogy, Socrates, of their heroes and men, and settlements of tribes, and how cities were founded of old, and, in a word, to everything relating to archaeology they listen with the greatest pleasure, so that I was forced to learn my lesson myself thoroughly for their sakes, and to practice myself well on those points. Socrates. By Zeus Hippias you were fortunate in that the Lacedaemonians did not take a delight in hearing a man who could reckon up our archons from the time of Solon, for otherwise you would have had some trouble in learning the list. Hippias, how so, Socrates? Upon hearing fifty names only once, 
I can repeat them from memory. Socrates, you speak the truth, but I did not bear in mind that you had a system of mnemonics, so that I understand why, reasonably enough, the Lacedaemonians are pleased with you as being a person who knows many things, and they make use of you, as children do of old women, to tell them pretty stories. Hippias, and by Zeus Socrates, I was lately in high repute there, by going through a lecture upon the honourable pursuits to which a young person should devote himself. For I have by me a very beautiful discourse upon that subject, well put together in other respects, and in the words. The form and commencement of the discourse is something of this kind. After Troy was taken, the story goes, that Neoptolemus inquired of Nestor what were the honourable pursuits a young man should follow to gain a good name. Upon this Nestor is the speaker, and suggests a great many and very excellent precepts laid down by law. Of this dissertation I made a display there, and on the third day hence I intend to display it here, and several other pieces of mine, worth the hearing in the school of Philostratus. For so has Eutychus, the son of Apimantus, requested. See, then, that you are present yourself, and bring with you others, who on hearing will be competent to decide upon what is then said. Socrates. This, if a god is willing, Hippias, shall be. But at present, answer me a short question relating to it, for you have opportunely put me in mind of it. A certain person has, thou best of men, very lately, during some conversations, thrown me into a difficulty, when I was finding fault with some things as being ugly, and praising others as being beautiful, by asking me, in a very saucy manner, from whence do you, Socrates, know, said he, what things are beautiful, and what ugly? Come then, tell me, if you can say a word, what is the beautiful? And I, through my want of wit, was at a loss, and had it not in my power to answer him with propriety. So, quitting his company, I grew angry with, and vented reproaches upon myself, and threatened that the first time I met with any of you wise men, I would hear his opinion and learn it, and, after studying it thoroughly, that I would return to my questioner, and fight out again the matter with him. Now, therefore, as I said, you are come opportunely, and do you instruct me sufficiently what is beauty in the abstract, and endeavour to give me as accurately as possible your answers, in order that I may not be confuted a second time, and pay the penalty of a laugh against myself? For assuredly you know it quite clearly, and it would be but a mite of the learning with which you are conversant on so many points. Hippias, by Zeus, a mite indeed, Socrates, and, so to say, of no value at all. Socrates, easily then shall I learn it, and no one will hereafter confute me. Hippias, not one indeed, for otherwise mean would be my profession, and suited to a common person. Socrates, by Juno, Hippias, you speak bravely, if we shall get the man into our clutches. But shall I be any hindrance by imitating him, if I lay hold of your arguments, while answering me, in order that you may exercise me the most, for I am nearly skilful in laying hold of arguments. If, then, it makes no difference to you, I am willing to lay hold of them, in order that I may learn with greater strength. Hippias, take hold, then, for, as I said just now, the question is not a great one, and I will teach you to answer questions much more difficult than this, so that not a single person will be ever able to confute you. Socrates, ye gods, how bravely you talk! But come, since you bid me, I will become him, and, as well as I can, try to question you. Now, if you shall give the lecture you mention upon beautiful pursuits, he will, after hearing it, when you have ceased speaking, inquire about nothing else except about the beautiful, for such a habit he has, and he will say, Art not, see, thou stranger from Ellis, the just just through justness. Answer now, Hippias, as if he were questioning you. Hippias, I answer through justness. Socrates, there is then such a thing as justness? Hippias, clearly so. Socrates, are not then the wise wise through wisdom, and all that is good, 
good through goodness. Hippias, how not? Socrates, by those things existing really, for it is not surely by their non-existing. Hippias, by their existing really. Socrates, are not all things that are beautiful, beautiful through beauty? Hippias, yes, through beauty. Socrates, by such a thing existing? Hippias, by its existing, for what should it be? Socrates, tell me now, stranger, he will say, what is this beauty? Hippias, does he who asks this question want to know what is a beautiful thing? Socrates, I think not, Hippias, but what is beauty? Hippias, how does this differ from that? Socrates, seems there to you no difference? Hippias, there is not any difference. Socrates, but, however, it is evident that you know better, consider, however, good sir, the question well. For he asks you, not what is a beautiful thing, but what is beauty. Hippias, I understand you, good sir, and I will answer his question, what is beauty? Nor shall I ever be confuted. For rest assured, Socrates, if the truth must be told that a beautiful maiden is a beautiful thing. Socrates, by the dog you have answered Hippias, beautifully and gloriously. Shall I then, when I answer thus, have answered the question correctly, and shall I never be refuted? Hippias, for how could you be refuted, Socrates, on that point which seems correct to all the world, and where all who hear you will testify in your favor that you are speaking properly? Socrates, be it so then, by all means. But come, Hippias, let me consider again with myself what you are saying, for the man will question me in some such manner as this. Come, Socrates, answer me. If beauty exists in the abstract, all those things which you say are beautiful, would these be beautiful? And I will then say that, if a beautiful maiden be a beautiful thing, through which the things would be beautiful. Hippias, think you then, that he will still attempt to confute you by asserting that what you say is beautiful is not so, or that, should he attempt it, he will not be laughed down. Socrates, that he will, thou wondrous man, I am well assured. But whether, after making the attempt, he will be laughed down, the thing itself will show. However, I wish to tell you what he will say. Hippias, tell it then. Socrates, what a sweet creature, Socrates, he will say you are. Is not a beautiful mare, which even a god has praised in an oracle, a beautiful thing? What shall we answer, Hippias? Shall we say aught else, then, that the mare is beautiful? At least the beautiful. For how should we dare to deny that a beautiful thing is beautiful? Hippias, you speak, Socrates, what is true, especially since the god rightly said it, for with us there are mares very beautiful. Socrates, be it so, he will say, but what? Is not a beautiful liar a beautiful thing? Shall we allow it, Hippias? Hippias, yes. Socrates, and after this he will say, as, guessing from his usual manner, I nearly know full well, my excellent fellow, is not a beautiful soup-dish a beautiful thing? Hippias, who is this man, Socrates? What an uneducated fellow, who thus presumes to express himself in words so low in an affair so solemn? Socrates, such is the fellow Hippias, not a fine gentleman, but a man of the mob, who cares for nothing but truth. He must, however, have an answer, and I appear speaking for him. If the soup-dish be made by a skilful potter, smooth and round, and well-baked, like some of the beautiful soup-dishes with two handles, containing six coos, very beautiful, if he inquires about such a soup-dish, we must confess it to be beautiful." For how could we say that what is beautiful is not beautiful? Hippias, not at all, Socrates. Socrates, is not a beautiful soup-dish, then, he will say, a beautiful thing? Answer, Hippias, but, Socrates, the case is, I think, this. Even such a vessel, when beautifully made, is a beautiful thing. But this taken as a whole does not deserve to be considered as beautiful as compared with a mare and a maiden, and the other things of beauty. Socrates, be it so. I understand you, Hippias, that we must thus reply to the person who puts such a question. You are ignorant, my man. 
that correct is the saying of Heraclitus, that the most beautiful ape, as compared with another kind, is ugly, and that the most beautiful of soup dishes is ugly, as compared with the maiden kind, as says Hippias the wise. Is it not so, Hippias? Hippias, you have answered Socrates quite correctly. Socrates, here then, for I know well he will say after this. What then, Socrates, should any one compare maiden kind with god kind, would he not be in the same case as when the maiden kind was compared to the soup dish kind? Would not the most beautiful maiden appear ugly? Or does not Heraclitus, whom you bring forward, say this very same thing, that the wisest of men, when compared with a god, appears an ape in wisdom and beauty, and everything else? Shall we confess, Hippias, the most beautiful maiden is ugly as compared with the god kind? Hippias, yes, for who Socrates would gainsay this at least? Socrates, should, however, we confess this, he will laugh and say, Do you then remember, Socrates, what you were asked? I shall reply, I do. It was this. What is beauty in the abstract? Whereupon he will rejoin, when you are asked about beauty in the abstract, you answer by mentioning that which happens to be, as you say yourself, not more beautiful than ugly. So it seems, I shall say. Or what else, my friend, do you advise me to say? Hippias, this I advise you, for that the human kind, as compared with the gods, is not beautiful, he will say the truth. Socrates, if I had asked you at the outset, he will say, what is a thing beautiful and ugly? Had you answered me, as you have done just now, would you not have answered correctly? And still, does it seem to you that the beautiful itself, by which everything else is decorated and looks beautiful, whenever that species of beauty is present to it, is a maiden, or a mare, or a liar? Hippias, if this Socrates he is seeking, it is of all things the easiest for me to tell him in answer, what is that beauty, by which all other things are decorated, and by which, being present, they appear beautiful. The man is the greatest simpleton, and knows nothing about beautiful chattels. For if you tell him in answer that the beautiful about which he is inquiring is nothing else than gold, he will be in a difficulty, and not attempt to confute you. For we all surely know that wherever gold is present to a thing, how ugly soever it may have seemed before, it will appear beautiful, when it is decorated at least with gold. Socrates. You have no experience of the man, Hippias, how difficult he is, and admitting nothing easily. Hippias. What matters it, Socrates, for what is correctly asserted he must admit, or, not admitting it, be laughed at. Socrates. And yet he will not only not admit this answer, thou best of men, but he will treat me with derision, and say, O oh, thou, puffed up with conceit, thinkest thou that Phidias was a bad workman? And I shall reply, I think so, by no manner of means. Hippias, and you will answer rightly, Socrates. Socrates, rightly indeed. Hereupon, when I have confessed that Phidias was a good workman, he will say, Do you imagine then that Phidias was ignorant of that which you call the beautiful? Why say you this especially, I shall reply? Because he will rejoin, if Phidias has made the eyes of Athene not of gold, nor yet the rest of her face, nor the feet, nor even the hands, since a thing of gold would have looked the most beautiful, but not of ivory, it is evident that he erred in this through ignorance, not knowing that gold is that which makes all things beautiful, wherever it is present. When he says this, what answer, Hippias, shall we give him? Hippias, the answer is not difficult, for we will see that he acted rightly, for ivory is, I presume, beautiful likewise. Socrates. Why, then, he will rejoin, did he not make the middle part of the eyes of ivory but of stone, having found in the stone a similarity as great as was possible to ivory? Or is a beautiful stone a beautiful thing? Shall we say so, Hippias? Hippias. We will say so, if it is becoming. Socrates but where it is unbecoming it is ugly. Shall I confess it or not? Hippias, confess, at least when it the stone is not becoming. Socrates, what then he will say? Do not ivory and gold, thou wiseacre, 
when they are becoming, cause things to appear beautiful, but when not, ugly. Shall we deny this, or acknowledge the man to be in the right? Hippias, we must acknowledge this at least, that whatever is becoming to any individual thing, causes it to appear beautiful. Socrates, when, then, he will say some one shall have cooked the beautiful soup dish, of which we have been speaking, full of beautiful porridge, whether does a ladle of gold become it, or one of fig-tree wood? Hippias, by Hercules, of what kind of fellow, Socrates, are you speaking? Will you not tell me who he is? Socrates, no, for you would not know him, should I tell you his name. Hippias, but I know already that he is some ignorant fellow. Socrates, he is a man of much thought, Hippias. But, however, what shall we say? Which of the two ladles becomes the porridge and the soup-dish? Or is it clearly the one of fig-tree wood? For this makes the porridge of a pleasanter flavour, and at the same time, my friend, it would not, by breaking the soup-dish, let the porridge run out, and extinguish the fire, and cause the guests, just about to feast on it, to be without a very noble dish. But all this the one of gold would do, so that it seems to me we ought to say that the one of fig-tree wood is more becoming than the one of gold, unless, indeed, you say otherwise. Hippias, it is indeed, Socrates, more becoming, but for my part I would not converse with a fellow who asked such questions as these. Socrates, and rightly so, my friend, for it would not become you to be polluted with such dirty words, you in a dress so beautiful, and with such beautiful sandals, and in such high repute amongst all the Greeks for wisdom. But for me it is nothing to mix myself up with the dirt of the man. Teach me then beforehand, and for my sake give a reply, for the man will say, if the ladle of fig-tree wood be indeed more becoming than the one of gold, is it not more beautiful, especially since you have confessed that the becoming is more beautiful than the unbecoming? Shall we confess that the ladle of fig-tree wood is more beautiful than the one of gold? Hippias, do you wish me, Socrates, to say that, by saying which, I think, you will free yourself from his much talking? Socrates, by all means, but not before you tell me which of the two ladles that we have been speaking of is the more becoming and more beautiful. Hippias. Well, then, if you will, tell him in answer that it is the one made from the fig tree. Socrates. Now, say what you were just about to say, for in this answer, by which I assert that gold is the beautiful, gold will not, as it seems to me, appear to be at all a thing more beautiful than fig tree would. But, what do you now say is the beautiful? Hippias, I will tell you, for you seem to me to seek to answer a question of this kind. What is that beauty which at no time and in no place will appear ugly to any one? Socrates, by all means, Hippias, and now you understand me perfectly well. Hippias, listen then, for rest assured that if any man has anything to say against this, I will say that I know nothing whatever. Socrates, by the gods, then, tell it as quickly as possible. Hippias, I assert, then, that it is at all times, and to all persons, and in all places, the most beautiful thing for a man, in wealth, health, and in honour amongst the Greeks, and having reached old age, and having laid his deceased parents handsomely in the grave, to be buried himself by his own children in a handsome and splendid manner. Socrates, capital Hippias, how wondrous well, and gorgeously, and how worthy of yourself have you spoken! And by Juno I am delighted with you, for the good will with which, as far as you can, you assist me. But we do not as yet reach the man's mind, but he will laugh the most at us, rest assured. Hippias, truly a silly laugh, Socrates, for when he shall have nothing to say against this, and merely laugh, he will laugh at himself and be the laughing-stock of all who are present. Socrates, such perhaps will be the case. Perhaps, however, after such an answer, there will be a danger, as I prophesy, of his not merely laughing at me. Hippias, what then? Socrates, that, should he happen to have a staff in his hand, unless I escape from him by flight, he will endeavour to reach me with a smart blow. Hippias, how say you? Is the man a master of yours? and will he not, for having done so, be brought to trial, and pay damages? 
or is your state not under the laws of justice and permits the citizens to beat each other unjustly socrates by no manner of means does it permit them hippias will he then not suffer punishment for striking you unjustly socrates i think not hippias not at all if i gave such an answer but justly as it seems to me hippias it seems then so to me socrates especially since you are of that opinion yourself socrates shall i then state why i think i should be justly beaten on giving such an answer or will you too beat me without a trial or will you receive a reason hippias it would be hard indeed socrates if i did not receive it but how say you socrates i will speak to you in the same manner as i did just now when imitating that person in order that i may not say to you what he will to me words both harsh and producing an angry feeling for rest assured he will say tell me socrates do you think a person would receive blows unjustly who should chaunt such a long rigmarole little in unison with and far distant from the question proposed how so i shall reply how you will rejoin cannot you remember that i asked you what is the beauty that enables everything to which it is present to become beautiful be it stone or wood or man or god or any act or any science for i am asking man what is beauty in the abstract and yet i am no more able to bawl anything into you than if you were lying by my side a stone and this too a millstone without ears and brains now hippias would not you be annoyed if i in a fright were to say after this abuse nay it was hippias who said that this was the beautiful although i asked him as you do me what is the beautiful to all persons and things and at all times what say you will you not be annoyed if i say so hippias i am quite certain socrates that what i said is the beautiful in every case will appear so socrates but will it be so he will say for surely the beautiful must always be beautiful hippias certainly socrates and always was so he will say hippias it was socrates did the elian stranger assert he will say that it was a beautiful thing for achilles to be buried after his progenitors and for his grandfather aeacus and the others born of the gods and even the gods themselves hippias what is this hurl him to the blessed land such questions as these of the fellow socrates are not to be spoken even as being of ill omen socrates how so it is surely no very ill-omened speech when one person asks a question for the other to say such is the fact hippias perhaps so socrates perhaps then you are the man he will say who asserts that it is a beautiful thing for every person and at all times to be buried by his descendants and to bury his parents now was not hercules one of the all and those two whom we have just now mentioned hippias but i did not say it was so for the gods socrates nor for the heroes as it seems hippias nor for such as were children of the gods socrates but for such only as were not hippias certainly socrates according to your reasoning then it seems that amongst the heroes it was a grievous and unholy thing for tantalus and dardanus and zethus but to pelops and to the others so born it was a beautiful thing hippias so it seems to me socrates it seems then to you he will say what you have lately denied that to some persons and at some times it is not a beautiful thing after burying their progenitors to be buried by their progeny and further as it seems that this cannot take place to all and be a beautiful thing so that this very thing is in the same case as those before namely the maiden in the soup dish and still more ridiculously to some it is a beautiful thing but to others it is not beautiful and even to-day he will say you are unable socrates to answer the question touching the beautiful what it is in these or such like terms will he reproach me justly should i answer him in this manner for very nearly after this fashion hippias does he for the most part converse sometimes however as if in pity for my want of skill and learning he proposes a problem and asks if such a thing as this seems to be the beautiful 
or he talks upon any other subject which he happens to have heard and about which there is a talk hippias how say you socrates this socrates i will tell you thou godlike socrates says he do cease to give such answers and on such grounds for they are very silly and easily confuted but consider now whether the beautiful be something of that kind which we just now touched upon in the answer when we said of gold that where it is becoming it is beautiful but where not it is not so and of all the rest likewise to which the becoming may be present on the becoming then itself and on its nature do you reflect becomingly whether this happens to be the beautiful now i am accustomed in such matters to assent on every occasion for i know not what to object but does it seem to you that the becoming is the beautiful hippias assuredly completely so socrates socrates let us reflect lest we be cheated like children merely hippias it is meet to reflect socrates observe then do we call the becoming that which by its presence causes each of those things to which it may be present to appear beautiful or that which causes them to be so really or neither of these hippias it appears so to me socrates whether that which causes things to appear beautiful as when a person puts on clothes or shoes which fit him he looks more beautiful although he is a laughing-stock now if the becoming causes things to appear more beautiful than they really are the becoming must be a deception with regard to the beautiful and it would not be that which we are seeking hippias for we are in search of that by which all things beautiful are beautiful as in the case of the surpassing by which all things are great for by this all things are great and though they may not appear so yet if they do surpass they must of necessity be great so we say of the beautiful by which all things are beautiful whether they appear to be so or not now this cannot be the becoming for the becoming causes things to appear more beautiful than they really are as your reasoning says and does not suffer them to appear as they are but as i said just now that which causes them to be really beautiful whether they appear so or not this we must endeavour to tell what it is for this we are seeking if we are seeking the beautiful hippias but the becoming socrates causes by its presence things both to be and to appear beautiful socrates it is impossible then for things really beautiful not to appear to be beautiful at least when that is present which causes them to appear so hippias it is impossible socrates shall we then hippias confess that all things really beautiful both institutions and pursuits truly beautiful are reputed to be beautiful and appear so always to all men or must we say quite the contrary that they are unknown and that dissension and contest take place respecting these points most of all both amongst individuals privately and publicly amongst states hippias in this way rather socrates that they are unknown socrates this would not have been unknown if the appearing to be beautiful had been added to the reality and added it would have been had the becoming been the beautiful and had caused things not only to be beautiful but to appear so likewise so that the becoming if it were that which causes things to be beautiful would be that beauty in the abstract of which we are in search and not which causes things to appear beautiful but if on the other hand the becoming merely causes things to appear only beautiful it cannot be the beautiful of which we are in search for this causes them to be so really now to cause things to appear to be beautiful and to be really so is not in the power of the same thing nor of anything else whatever let us then choose whether you think the becoming causes things to appear beautiful or to be so really hippias i think socrates to appear so socrates 
alas! Gone and fled away from us, Hippias, has the knowledge of what the beautiful is, especially since the becoming has been seen to be a thing different from the beautiful. Hippias, so by Zeus it has, Socrates, and to me at least, very unexpectedly. Socrates, but let us not, my friend, give up seeking for it, for I have still some hope that what the beautiful is will appear again. Hippias, altogether assuredly, Socrates, for it is not difficult to find. At least, I know well that, were I to retire into solitude for a little time, and commune with myself, I should describe it to you more accurately than accuracy itself. Socrates, hold, Hippias, talk not so big. You see what trouble it has given us already, lest it should grow angry with us and run away still further than before. And yet I am saying nothing to the purpose, for you will, I think, easily find it out when you come to be alone, and do, by the gods, find it out in my presence. But if you are willing, seek it as now with me, and if we find it, it will be the best of all. But if we do not, I shall be content, I think, with my misfortune, while you going away will find it easily. But if we find it now, depend upon it, I shall not trouble you by inquiring what that was which you had discovered by yourself. For the present, consider it, if it seems to you to be the beautiful. I say that it is, but keep your eye on me, and give me all your attention, that I may not say anything silly. Let, then, that which is useful be for us the beautiful, and this I say from thinking on these points. The eyes, we say, are beautiful, not when they seem to be such, but are unable to see, but when they are able and useful for seeing. Is it not so? Hippias, it is. Socrates, say we not, then, of the whole body thus, that one part of it is beautiful for running, another for wrestling, and further, that all the animal kind, as a beautiful horse, and a cock, and a quail, and all utensils and vehicles, for land and sea, ships and triremes, and all instruments, both for music, and the other arts, and pursuits, and laws, and nearly everything we call beautiful, are in the same position, and, looking to each of them, in what way it has been born, made, or laid down, we speak of a thing which is useful, as being beautiful in what it is useful, and for what it is useful, and when it is useful. But another thing, which is entirely useless, we call not beautiful. Does it not so seem to you, Hippias? Hippias, to me it does. Socrates, correctly then do we now say that the useful happens to be more than all beautiful. Hippias, correctly, Socrates. Socrates, now is not each thing which is able to affect anything useful so far as it is able, but that which is unable useless? Hippias, entirely so. Socrates, power then is beautiful, and want of power is not beautiful? Hippias, very much so. And the rest of things, Socrates, testify in our favor that such is the case, but particularly as regards matters of state for of all things it is the most beautiful for a person to be powerful in state affairs, and in his own city, but to be powerless the least so. Socrates, you say well. By the gods, then, Hippias, is not wisdom on this account the most beautiful of all things, and ignorance the least so. Hippias, what else do you think, Socrates? Socrates, softly, my dear friend, since I have a fear about what I am saying. Hippias, what do you fear, Socrates, for your reasoning has proceeded very beautifully at present? Socrates, I wish it had, but do you consider this with me? Could a person do anything of which he knows nothing, and for which he has no power? Hippias, by no means, for how could he do that for which he has no power? Socrates, are then they who err, and act wrong, and do a thing unwillingly, other than those who would not have so acted unless they had possessed the power? Hippias, it is evident, Socrates, but, however, they who are powerful are powerful through power, for assuredly it is not through want of power. Hippias, 
Certainly not. Socrates. All then who do anything are able to do what they do? Hippias. Yes. Socrates. And all men, beginning from boyhood, do many more evil things than good, and err unwillingly? Hippias. The fact is so. Socrates. What then? Shall we say that this power and these means, however useful they may be for the doing evil, are beautiful, or do they want much of being so? Hippias. They want much, in my opinion, Socrates. Socrates. The powerful, then, and the useful, Hippias, are not, it seems, the beautiful. Hippias. If indeed, Socrates, it has power to do good, or is useful for things of that kind. Socrates. Away then has fled that thing at once the powerful and the useful as being without exception beautiful. Now, this was that very thing, Hippias, which our soul meant to say, that the beautiful consists in utility and the power to produce some good. Hippias, so it seems to me. Socrates, now, this is the advantageous, is it not? Hippias, it is. Socrates, Thus, then, beautiful bodies, and beautiful institutions, and wisdom, and all these things we just now mentioned are beautiful because advantageous. Hippias, evidently so. Socrates, the advantageous, then, appears to be, Hippias, to us, the beautiful. Hippias, entirely so, Socrates. Socrates, but the advantageous is that which affects a good. Hippias, it is. Socrates. Now, that which affects is nothing else than a cause, is it not? Hippias. It is so. Socrates. The beautiful, therefore, is a cause of the good. Hippias. It is so. Socrates. Now the cause, Hippias, and that of which it is the cause are different, for the cause cannot surely be a cause of a cause. Consider it in this way. Did not the cause appear to be a maker? Hippias. Clearly. Socrates. That which is made by the maker is nothing else but the produced, but is not itself the maker. Hippias. Such is the fact. Socrates. The produced, then, is one thing, and the producer is another? Hippias. Yes. Socrates. The producer, then, is not the cause of itself, but of that which is produced by it. Hippias, entirely so. Socrates, if, then, the beautiful is the cause of a good, such a good must be produced by the beautiful, and for this reason, as it seems, we attend to intelligence and all other beautiful things, because their work and issue are worthy of attention, as being the good, and, from what we are discovering, the beautiful is near to being in the form, as it were, of a father to the good. Hippias, entirely so, for you speak beautifully, Socrates. Socrates, say I not this too beautifully, that neither is the father the son, nor is the son the father. Hippias, beautifully indeed. Socrates, nor is the cause the thing produced, nor is, on the other hand, the thing produced the cause. Hippias, you say what is true. Socrates, by Zeus then, thou best of men, neither is the beautiful the good, nor is the good the beautiful, or does it seem to you from what has been said that it is possible? Hippias, by Zeus, it appears to me not possible. Socrates, does it then please us, and are we willing to assert that the beautiful is not good, nor the good beautiful? Hippias, by Zeus, it does not please me at all. Socrates, and by Zeus Hippias, to me too it pleases the least of all the assertions we have made. Hippias, and reasonably so. Socrates, the assertion then, which just now appeared the most correct of all, that the advantageous and the useful and the powerful to do some good was the beautiful, runs the risk of not being so, but if possible of being more ridiculous than the first mentioned, in which we conceived the maiden and each of the things before mentioned to be the beautiful. Hippias, it seems so, indeed. Socrates, and I too, Hippias, have no longer where to turn myself, but am at a loss. Have you anything to say? Hippias, not at least for the present, 
but as i said just now i know well that on reflection i shall find it out socrates but through my eagerness to know i seem to myself unable to wait your delay for after being somewhat in doubt i think i have just now found out a way for consider if we call that beautiful which causes us to be delighted i do not mean all pleasures but that which arises through the hearing and the sight how and for what could we contend for surely beautiful men hippias and embroidery of all kinds and pictures of animals and earthenware do when they are beautiful delight us while we look upon them and so likewise do beautiful sounds and music in general and conversations and story-telling produce the very same effect so that should we say in reply to that swaggering fellow my man of metal the beautiful is that which produces pleasure through the hearing and the sight think you that we should restrain him from his swaggering hippias what the beautiful is seems socrates to me at least to be well defined socrates what then shall we say hippias that pursuits and institutions being pleasant through the hearing or through the sight are beautiful or have they some other kind of beauty hippias these beautiful things will perhaps socrates lie hid from the man socrates but by the dog not from the person hippias before whom i should be the most ashamed to trifle and to pretend to say something to the purpose when i was saying nothing hippias who is he socrates the son of sophroniscus who would no more suffer me to say off-hand what has not been investigated than to speak as if i knew what i did not know hippias to myself too it appears since you have mentioned it that the case is different as regards institutions socrates softly hippias for we have fallen into the very same difficulty respecting the beautiful as we were in just now and we are in danger of conceiving ourselves to be in a pretty easy road hippias how say you so socrates socrates i will state what to me appears to be beautiful if indeed i am saying any to the purpose that which relates to institutions and pursuits would perhaps appear to be not removed from the sensations which arise through the hearing and sight but let us abide a while by the definition that what is through those senses pleasant is beautiful without bringing before us the question relating to institutions now should the man i mentioned or any one else ask us why have ye hippias and socrates separated from the pleasant in general that species of it in which ye say consists the beautiful and yet deny that what relates to the other sensations connected with food and drink and sexual intercourse and all the rest of such a kind are beautiful or do ye assert that these are not pleasant and that there are no pleasures at all in such sensations nor in anything else except seeing and hearing what shall we say hippias hippias we will say by all means socrates that in the other things likewise there are very great pleasures socrates why then he will say do ye take away from these pleasures really existing no less than those their very name and deprive them of the property of being beautiful because we will say there is not one who would not laugh at us were we to say that to eat is not a pleasant but a beautiful thing and to smell sweet not a pleasant thing but beautiful but with regard to sexual intercourse all would surely admit that it is to us a thing the most pleasant but it is meet so to carry it on if a person will do it as that no one see him since it is a deed the most disgraceful to behold on our saying this hippias he will perhaps remark i now perceive that you have been of old ashamed to say that these pleasures are beautiful because they do not seem so to men now i did not ask what seems to be beautiful to the multitude but what is so in reality whereupon we shall i presume state in reply that we asserted that this part of the pleasant arising from the sight and hearing was a beautiful thing but have you it in your power to use the reasoning for anything or shall we hippias say anything else hippias against what has been urged socrates it is necessary to say no other than this socrates truly 
do ye say well he will reply if then the pleasure coming through the sight and hearing be a beautiful thing that which does not happen to be a part of such pleasant sensations it is clear cannot be beautiful shall we confess it hippias yes socrates is then that which is pleasurable he will say through the sight pleasurable through the sight and hearing conjointly or that which is pleasurable through the hearing pleasurable through the hearing and the sight conjointly by no means we shall answer would that which exists through either exist through both for this you seem to us to say whereas we assert that each of these pleasurable things would be beautiful taken by themselves and both together should we not answer thus hippias by all means socrates does then he will say any pleasure whatever differ from any other pleasure whatever in this namely in being a pleasure for i ask not whether any pleasure is greater or less or more or less but whether any one differs by this very thing in one of the pleasures being a pleasure but the other not a pleasure does it not seem so to us hippias for it does not seem so socrates for some other reason then he will say then because they are pleasures have ye selected these from all the rest and having some such view with regard to both that they differ in some respect from the rest did ye not looking to this say that they are beautiful for seeing is surely not a beautiful thing on this account that it is through seeing for if this were the reason of its being beautiful the other pleasure that through hearing would not be beautiful as not partaking of that which is peculiar to the sense of seeing shall we say you speak the truth hippias we will socrates nor on the other hand is the pleasure through the hearing beautiful on this account that it is through hearing for then that through seeing would not be beautiful as not partaking of that which is peculiar to the sense of hearing shall we say hippias that the man in speaking so speaks correctly hippias yes correctly socrates but both he will rejoin are beautiful as you assert for so we say hippias we do socrates they have then something in common and the same which causes them to be beautiful and which belongs to both conjointly and severally to each for otherwise they would not be beautiful conjointly and severally give to me a reply as if to him hippias i answer that it appears to me as you say socrates if then these pleasures taken conjointly are affected by any circumstance but not so if taken separately they could not at least under that circumstance be beautiful hippias how could it be possible socrates that when neither are affected by any circumstance whatever that both should be affected by that by which neither is affected socrates you think it is impossible hippias yes for a great want of acquaintance with the nature of those things would possess me and of speaking the present speeches socrates you speak pleasantly hippias for i am in danger equally of fancying i see something so circumstanced as you aver to be impossible but yet i see nothing clearly hippias you are no danger socrates but you very readily look aside socrates and yet many things of such a kind appear to me before my soul but i distrust them because they do not present themselves to you who have made the most money of all now famed for wisdom but only to myself who have never made any and i have an idea my friend that you are playing with me and are willingly deceiving me such strong and so many hippias no one will know better than yourself socrates whether i am playing with you or not if you will only endeavour to tell me what are those things that have presented themselves to you for you will be seen to say nothing to the purpose for you will never find that both of us have been affected by circumstances together by which neither you nor i have been separately socrates how say you hippias but perhaps you are speaking something to the purpose and i do not understand it do you then hear from me what i wish to state more clearly for it appears to me that what neither i have been under the circumstance of being nor am 
nor, on the other hand, what you are under such a circumstance, it is possible for both to be, and, on the other hand, that other things, which both of us are under the circumstance of being, neither of us are. Hippias, you appear to me, Socrates, to exhibit in your answers again still greater wonders than when you answered before. For just consider, if both of us were just, would not each of us be so? Or, if each unjust, would not both be so? If both were in health, would not each be so? Or if each were wearied, or wounded, or struck, or were affected in any other way whatever, would not both of us be affected in the same way? Still further, if both of us happened to be made of gold, or silver, or ivory, or, if you will, well-born, or wise, or held in honour, or old, or young, or in any state you will, incident to man, is there not a great necessity for each to be so? Socrates. Most assuredly. Hippias. But neither do you, Socrates, consider things as wholes, nor do they, with whom you are wont to converse. For, taking separately the beautiful, and each of things existing, you discuss it in your discourses, cutting it into fractions, and hence things of great size, and of continuous length, escape your observation. And to such an extent have they escaped you now, that you conceive there is something, either circumstance or being, which, as regards two things taken jointly, does exist, but does not as regards them taken singly, or, on the other hand, does exist as regards each taken singly, but not as regards both taken jointly. So, illogically, and inconsiderately, and sillily, and unreflectingly, do you conduct yourselves. Socrates. Such is our condition, Hippias. It is not what a man wishes, say the persons using everywhere the proverb, but what he can. But you are always assisting us with your admonitions, since even now, before I had been thus admonished by you how sillily we conduct ourselves, shall I give you still a plainer proof by stating what were our thoughts upon those points, or shall I not? Hippias, you will speak to one who knows already Socrates, for I am conversant with each one of those who are engaged in disputations, and how they are situated. Still, if it is more agreeable to yourself, say on. Socrates, to me indeed it will be more agreeable, for we were, thou best of men, so silly before you said so of us, as to conceive, with regard to myself and you, that each of us was one person, and that both could not be what each was, for we are not one, but two persons. Such a simpleton was I. But now we have been taught the contrary, that if both together are two persons, each of us also is of necessity two, and that if each of us be one, it is necessary for both of us to be one. For by a continuous argument respecting being, it is not possible, according to Hippias, for it to be otherwise. But now, having been persuaded by you that whatever both of two things are, this too each of them is, I sit down here. But first remind me, Hippias, whether you and I are one, you and I together, or you are two, and I two. Hippias. What mean you, Socrates? Socrates. What I say, for I am afraid to speak plainly to you because you are harsh with me whenever you seem to yourself to speak something to the purpose. But, however, tell me, is not each of us one, and so affected as to be one? Hippias, certainly. Socrates, if, then, each of us be one, each of us must be also odd. Or, think you that one is not an odd number? Hippias, I think it is. Socrates, are we, then, both odd being two? Hippias. This Socrates could not be. Socrates. But both together are even. Is it not so? Hippias. Certainly. Socrates. Now because both together are even, is each of us on this account even? Hippias. Certainly not. Socrates. It is not then necessary, as you said just now, that what we both are together, we should be singly and that what each is, we should both be. Hippias, not in these cases, but in those I spoke of before. Socrates, 
these are sufficient hippias for we must be content with these since it appears that some things are so but others not for i stated if you remember at the point from whence this conversation diverged that the pleasures through the sight and through hearing could not be beautiful in that by which each happened to be affected singly and not both jointly or both jointly and not each singly but by what they were affected jointly and singly and hence you admitted that both together and each singly were beautiful on this account then i conceived that by the existence which follows upon both they ought if both were beautiful to be themselves beautiful but not by the existence wanting to the other and i think so still but tell me as if at the beginning of our inquiry if the pleasure through the sight and that through hearing are beautiful both jointly and each singly does not that which makes them so follow on both jointly and each singly hippias certainly socrates is it then because each singly is a pleasure and both two jointly that they are beautiful or on this account alone because all the other pleasures would be in no respect less beautiful for if you remember the latter were shown to be pleasures no less than the former hippias i remember it well socrates but because these are through the sight and hearing on that account it was asserted they were beautiful hippias it was so asserted socrates see now whether i speak the truth it was stated as my memory serves me not that the pleasurable of every kind was beautiful but such as was through the sight and hearing hippias it is true socrates does not this circumstance then attend on both taken together but not on each taken singly for by no means does each of them as was said before exist through both but both through both and each not is it so hippias it is socrates each of them is not beautiful through that which does not attend each for the both does not attend upon the either so that we can by the hypothesis call both beautiful but we cannot call either so or how say we is it not of necessity so hippias so it appears socrates shall we then say that both are beautiful but deny that each is so hippias what is to prevent it socrates this seems to me my friend to prevent it because there were to us some things so appertaining to each that if they appertained to both they would appertain likewise to each and if to each to both likewise all such you went through is it not so hippias yes socrates but what i went through were not so of which was itself the each and the both is it so hippias it is socrates of what kind then hippias does the beautiful seem to you whether as you asserted that if i and you are strong both are so and if i and you are just both are so and if both so too is each and similarly if i and you are beautiful both are so and if both so too is each or is there nothing to prevent it as in the case of numbers where some things taken together being even may be when taken singly odd and perhaps even or when each being taken separately is perhaps irrational but taken both together may be rational or perhaps irrational and there are other things of this kind infinite in number which i said presented themselves to me now on which side do you place the beautiful on that as it appears to me or to yourself for it appears to me a great absurdity for both of us to be beautiful yet each of us not so or for each to be beautiful yet both not so or as regards any other thing whatever of such a kind do you choose to say in this way or that hippias in this way socrates socrates and you do wisely hippias in order that we may be freed from a further search for if any of these things is the beautiful the pleasurable which comes through the sight and hearing would no longer be the beautiful for the pleasurable that comes through the sight and hearing causes both taken together to be beautiful 
but not either singly. This, however, cannot be, as I and you, Hippias, have agreed. Hippias, we have agreed. Socrates, it is impossible, then, for that which is pleasurable through the sight and hearing to be the beautiful, since a thing being produced as beautiful exhibits something of the impossible. Hippias, such is the case. Socrates, say then again from the beginning, he will say, since you have erred in this, what to say you is that beauty which attends upon both these pleasures, for the sake of which you honoured them before the others, and called them beautiful. To me, Hippias, there seems a necessity to say that these are of all pleasures the most harmless, and the best, taken together and singly, or have you to state anything else by which they are different from other pleasures? Hippias, by no means, for they are in reality the best. Socrates, this, then, he will say, do you now assert the beautiful to be, namely, pleasure that is advantageous? So it seems I shall answer, but what you? Hippias, I too the same. Socrates, is not, then, he will say, the advantageous that which is the efficient of good? Now, the efficient, as shown lately, is a thing different from the effect, and the reasoning has now come to you to the former reasoning, for neither would the good be a beautiful thing, nor would the beautiful be a good thing, since each of these is something else. This we shall more than all assert if, Hippias, we are of sound mind, for it is surely not just not to agree with him who speaks correctly. Hippias, but what, Socrates, do you conceive to be all this taken together? They are the parings and snippings, as I said just now, of reasonings separated into little bits. But that is a thing both beautiful and of great worth to be able to put together well and beautifully a speech before a court of justice, or the council hall, or any other official tribunal before whom the speech may be addressed, and, after producing conviction, to depart, carrying off, not the least, but the greatest of prizes, in the preservation of oneself, and one's own property, and that of one's friends. These, then, you ought to lay hold of, and to bid adieu to such petty disputes, in order that you may not seem to be a simpleton by taking, as just now, trifles and inanities in hand. Socrates, you, my dear Hippias, are a happy man, for you know what pursuits a simpleton should follow, and have followed them, as you say, sufficiently. But the misfortune of an evil genius, as it seems, lays hold of me, who am wandering continually and in doubt. For when I make a display of my doubts before you wise men, I am ever bespattered with dirt by you when I make a display. For ye tell me what you tell me now, that I busy myself about matters foolish, trivial, and worthless. But when, on the other hand, convinced by you, I say as ye do, that it is by far the best thing to be able to put together well and beautifully a speech, and to go through it before a court of justice, or any other concourse of people, I hear myself ill-spoken of in all ways, both by some others here, but especially from that person who is always confuting me, for he happens to be my nearest of kin, and lives in the same house. Whenever, then, I enter my dwelling at home, and he hears me talking in this way, he asks me if I do not feel a shame in presuming to converse about beautiful pursuits, after I have been so clearly convicted that on the subject of the beautiful I do not know what it is in the abstract. And how then, says he, will you know who has put together a beautiful speech or not, or done any other beautiful act, while knowing nothing of the beautiful? And when you are in such a situation, think you it is better for you to live than to die? Thus it has happened, as I told you, for me to hear myself ill-spoken of, and reproached by you, and to be abused by him. But 